I mean, quantum mechanics has, um, I suppose, grew out of an attempt to describe matter, the, the structure of matter, to understand um, atoms and molecules. Although it's, it's worth saying that uh, atoms and molecules, in the way we conceive of them today, uh, were, were not known to exist, or the structure of them was not known in 1900. Yet that search for the invisible didn't begin in the 20th century. It began more than 400 years earlier with a man standing in the snow. Johannes Kepler once held a snowflake in his hand and wondered, why do they all have six sides? That seemingly innocent question sparked a centuries-long journey to understand what truly dictates the shape of everything, from the smallest speck of dust to the most colossal stars, and in the process of finding the answer. Humanity discovered an unbelievable truth. Reality is not smooth and continuous as we perceive it. Light isn't emitted in a steady stream, but in discrete, rhythmic pulses. A particle can be in multiple places at once, and things only become real when we look at them. This is the story of how humanity peeled back the layers of the universe, starting from a single snowflake in Kepler's hand, all the way to the absolute limits of time and space, a place where the human mind can finally grasp its own role in the cosmos. On a winter day in 1611, the astronomer Johannes Kepler stood in the falling snow, watching the ice crystals land on his glove. They were all unique. Yet strangely, they all had six sides. Why six? Why not seven or eight? Kepler wrote a short book called The Six-Cornered Snowflake, in which he speculated that some hidden law in the microscopic world must be drawing their shape at the time. Humans knew nothing of atoms or water molecules. But Kepler's intuition was astonishing. He believed the macroscopic world had to be governed by invisible laws on a smaller scale. Three centuries later, at the end of the 19th century, physicists thought they had nearly solved all the universe's secrets. From Newton to Maxwell, every phenomenon from the orbits of planets to the flow of electricity in a copper wire seemed perfectly explainable with mathematics. The world looked neat, logical, and deterministic. But then one small, seemingly harmless detail brought the entire picture crashing down the light emitted by hot objects. When you heat a bar of iron, you see it glow first red, then orange, and finally, a brilliant white. That seems normal. But when physicists tried to calculate the energy it was emitting, they found something bizarre, according to classical equations. The light at short wavelengths like ultraviolet rays should carry infinite energy. In other words, if you heated the iron bar just a little more, it would release an endless amount of energy. Enough to incinerate the world. It was absurd. Experiments said no, but the math fell silent. At that moment, physicists realized the universe was hiding something they had never imagined. In 1900, Max Planck, a cautious and conservative physicist, stepped in with a single goal to make the math fit the data. He proposed an idea that seemed nonsensical energy wasn't emitted continuously, but only in discrete packets, proportional to the frequency of the light. He called these packets quanta. At first, Planck saw this as a temporary mathematical trick. He never suspected that his small fix would become the pivot point for all of modern physics. From that moment on, our familiar picture of the universe continuous, smooth, predictable began to fracture. In its place, a discreet, jumpy, and irrational world began to emerge. We call that moment the dawn of quantum mechanics, and it didn't begin with a giant telescope. But with a simple question, why do snowflakes have six sides? But if Planck was right, if energy truly comes in packets, then that would mean light which seemed so smooth and continuous, might actually be a stream of particles, after Planck published his idea of energy packets. Most of the scientific community dismissed it as a mere mathematical convenience. But one man saw something deeper in that trick, Albert Einstein. In 1905, Einstein was working at a patent office in Bern, Switzerland. He had no laboratory, only paper, a pen, and his imagination. And one early spring day, he asked himself, if light really travels in discrete packets of energy, what happens when it hits matter? To test this, he looked at a seemingly familiar phenomenon, the photoelectric effect. When you shine light on a metal plate, 
electrons can be knocked loose, creating a small electric current. According to classical theory, if you just increase the brightness meaning, the intensity of the wave electrons should eventually be knocked out, even if it took a while. But experiments showed the exact opposite red light. No matter how intense, couldn't push a single electron out. Yet blue or violet light, even if faint, caused them to fly off instantly. Einstein realized the solution lay in Planck's idea. Light doesn't spread like a uniform wave, but travels as a stream of particles energy bullets that we now call photons. Each photon carries a specific amount of energy. Only if a single photon's energy is high enough can it knock an electron out of the metal. Increasing the brightness simply means shooting more photons, but if each bullet is too weak, the door will never open. Einstein's explanation sounds simple, but its implication was world-shattering light is both a wave and a particle. Something could spread out like a wave in space, but when it interacted with matter, it behaved like a collection of individual bullets. This was a truth that baffled every physicist of the time. And the irony is, the man who proposed the theory of relativity who proved that time and space could be bent was the very person who gave birth to the concept of the discrete photon, paving the way for quantum mechanics. Einstein had laid the first stone, but he had no idea that this very theory would one day become his greatest source of frustration. Because the deeper scientists looked, the more they realized if both light and electrons can behave like waves. What would happen if we forced them to go down two paths at the same time? Could a single particle truly interfere with itself? To find the answer, scientists designed one of the most famous experiments in history, the double-slit experiment. Imagine you have an electron gun firing individual electrons toward a barrier with two narrow slits. Behind it is a screen that records where they land. If electrons were just tiny marbles, we would expect to see two bright lines lined up with the two slits. But the actual result stunned the world. An interference pattern appeared exactly like the pattern created by water waves. Even more astonishing, when they slowed down the gun to fire electrons one at a time, the interference pattern still emerged. It was as if each electron spread out like a wave, passed through both slits at the same time, and then interfered with itself. But when scientists placed a detector to watch which slit the electron went through, the wave pattern instantly vanished, leaving only two simple lines, just as if they were particles. It was as if the very act of observation forced the universe to pick a specific outcome before being seen. All possibilities existed simultaneously. The electron went through the left slit and the right slit at the same time. But the moment we measured it, we forced it to decide to choose one path. This is the principle of superposition a particle can exist in multiple states at once, until an observation causes it to collapse into a single reality. The idea sounds like magic, but it's not a hypothesis, it's a fact, verified hundreds of times. And when scientists expanded the experiment to two separate particles, they discovered something even stranger quantum entanglement. When two particles are created together, they become an entangled pair even if they are separated by thousands of kilometers. Measuring one particle instantly affects the other. If one particle is measured to be spinning up, the other will instantly be spinning down no signal sent. No time delay. Einstein, the man who had opened the door to quantum mechanics, hated this. He called it spooky action at a distance because it seemed to violate the universal speed limit. The speed of light. But decades later, Sophisticated experiments proved him wrong. The effect is real. Reality at its most fundamental level is not separate as we perceive it. It is interconnected, superimposed, and so counterintuitive that even Einstein himself was deeply troubled by it. This leads to an even bigger question if a particle can be in multiple states at once, and two particles can feel each other instantly. Could we exploit this to compute or transmit information in a way that classical machines never could. For most of the 20th century, superposition and entanglement were seen as nature's magic tricks beautiful, but useless. Physicists studied them out of curiosity, not with any expectation of turning them into technology. But then, at the end of the century, a bold idea emerged if the universe allows a particle to exist in multiple states at once. 
Why can't we build a machine that does the same? A classical computer, the one playing this video right now, works with bits, which can only be a zero or a one. All data, images, and sounds are encoded from billions of combinations of these two numbers. But in the quantum world, a qubit, the basic unit of a quantum computer can be a zero, a one, or both at the same time. Instead of choosing one of two states, it holds both in superposition. This might sound abstract. So imagine this if a classical bit is like standing at a fork in the road and having to choose one path. A qubit is like being able to walk down both paths simultaneously. Only when you reach the destination do you know which path you took. When we combine many qubits, their potential states grow exponentially. Two qubits can hold four states. Three qubits can hold eight. And with just 300 qubits, you could represent more states than there are atoms in the entire observable universe, while a classical computer has to try every possibility one by one. A quantum computer can hold all possibilities in superposition at once and then let nature itself find the right answer. It's no longer an electronic processor. It's a machine that leverages the fundamental laws of reality to compute. This opens up an entirely new horizon. Quantum computers could simulate complex molecules to design new drugs, discover new materials, or break the encryption that our current digital world relies on. It's not faster in the conventional sense it thinks differently, by harnessing superposition, not by running in a straight line. However, taming the quantum world is not easy. A single vibration or a stray photon can cause the entire system of qubits to collapse a phenomenon called decoherence. That's why they must be kept at temperatures near absolute zero to avoid interference. Building a stable quantum computer is like trying to keep a soap bubble from bursting in a hurricane. But every year, we get closer. Labs around the world from Google and IBM to national research centers are in a race to master this uncertainty. The question is no longer, will it work? But when will we truly control it? And as we begin to control the quantum world, Another fascinating question arises, does the universe itself operate like a giant quantum computer? If so, what is the fundamental ruler from which everything is written? We now know that at the smallest scales, the universe follows bizarre rules. Energy comes in packets. Particles can be in two places at once. And things only become stable when we observe them. But what amazed physicists most is this. Those tiny rules can decide the fate of the largest objects in the cosmos. Three fundamental constants are woven into this entire journey the speed of light at sea. The ultimate speed limit. The gravitational constant, g, which measures the curvature of space-time. And Planck's constant, h, the pulse of the quantum world. When you combine them, you get a special set of measurements known as the Planck units numbers not invented by humans, but set by nature itself. Among them is a value that is almost impossible to imagine the Planck length. Approximately 1.6 tat to 35 miller. If you were to magnify a single proton to the size of our entire solar system, the Planck length would be about the size of a single speck of dust. It is so small that no instrument, not even the most powerful microscope, can peer down to that level. Many physicists believe that at this scale, Space-time is no longer smooth but becomes pixelated, like a digital image. Each pixel is the smallest possible unit of space, a point where all the laws of physics as we know them begin to break down. What's fascinating is that from these pixels, we can understand the largest phenomena. For example, the information contained within a black hole, a region of space from which light cannot escape, is not proportional to its volume, but to its surface area measured in units of Planck squares, for every Planck pixel on a black hole's edge. A finite amount of information can be stored. In other words, a black hole is a cosmic hard drive, and its data is printed on its surface, not stored inside. From these same numbers, we can calculate the Chandrasekhar limit the maximum mass a star can have before it collapses into a neutron star or a black hole. That number. About 1.4 times the mass of our sun is not random. It arises from the balance between the quantum pressure of electrons pushing outward and gravity pulling everything inward. A macroscopic phenomenon, written by a microscopic quantum law.
All of this forces us to see the universe with new eyes. It seems that everything massive is built upon the smallest of limits, from photons to black holes, from the Planck length to the size of galaxies. The universe operates like a symphony where the tiniest notes shape the grandest chords. And as we begin to understand how these fundamental rulers weave together, we are finally learning to read the language in which the universe is written. When we look up at the night sky, we see billions of stars, but in reality, that's just a thin slice of the cosmos. Beyond that light are deep, empty voids where galaxies drift apart and time itself seems to stretch to infinity. In this picture, humanity is so small we nearly vanish, a creature that lives for less than a century, on a speck of dust orbiting an ordinary star. And yet, if life is as rare as many scientists believe, then our smallness is precisely what makes us grand. Because it's possible that in this moment in cosmic history, we are the only way the universe knows itself, Carl Sagan famously said. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. Every photon in your eye, every electron in your brain, was once part of a star that died billions of years ago. When you think, when you ask the question why, it is the universe asking itself about itself, that feeling. If fully understood, doesn't make us feel small, it makes us feel responsible. But what is that responsibility? Perhaps it is not just to see, but to create. Just as life once transformed the atmosphere of Earth, perhaps one day, human intelligence will begin to transform the cosmos itself. Today, we are on the threshold of a multiplanetary era, reusable rockets, the first bases on the Moon and Mars, and satellites blanketing Earth's orbit all are signs of a civilization learning to expand beyond its birthplace. Each small step into space is not just a technical achievement, it is proof that life can reach beyond where it began. And if biological evolution brought us out of the oceans, perhaps intellectual evolution will carry us out of the solar system. Maybe in millions of years, humanity or our descendants will not just travel between the stars, but will learn to harness their energy. And perhaps even the very structure of space-time itself. Some physicists, like David Deutsch, have argued that life may not just observe the universe but can actually shape it. Perhaps one day, when we fully understand the laws of quantum mechanics and gravity, we will no longer just be reading the language of the universe. We will know how to write the next chapter. That scenario sounds like science fiction. But remember, all of quantum mechanics was once just a mathematical trick until it became world-changing technology. It may be that one day, Human consciousness of flame lit from the ashes of stars will become a guiding light for the universe itself. And when that moment comes, we might realize that from a single snowflake that Kepler admired on his glove, from the packets of energy Planck called quanta, from Einstein's photons, and from our own relentless curiosity, the universe finally learned to understand itself. If you feel overwhelmed by the vastness of the universe, just remember every thought you have, every question you ask, is a part of the cosmos trying to understand itself. Leave a comment below what do you think our future looks like in this grand picture? Because who knows? In those very questions, we might just be writing the next chapter of the universe.